So when I got brought on to this project, Peter Seraf and Yuri Henley, our producers who brought me this project, they said, listen, we've always imagined Tom Hanks in this part, but he's passed on the project. He's passed three times or something we've tried. Um, and I said, well, I kind of have a relationship with him. I could try. <laughs> and I called him, and within five days, he had signed on to the project. So it was like I performed a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll never be that cool again. Hi, everybody. Thank you. My name is Joe McGovern, but please join me in welcoming the wonderful filmmaker, Marielle Heller. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good af evening. E evening, I guess. Um, Thank you for being here. Congratulations again on the film. Uh, Thank you. It's wonderful. So I want to start with um, something, I, a story you've told before, but for anyone here who hasn't already heard it, uh, it's just so cute. About four or five years ago, you were at a birthday party in California. Um, and as you do, when you go to a kid's birthday party, you might meet the grandparents. Yes. And you met <laughs> the grandfather of this little girl. Named Tom Hanks. Named Tom yeah. Hanks. <laughs> Yes, I'm friends with Tom's son, Colin. So we were at a backyard birthday party, and I was chatting with Tom Hanks. And uh, he asked me what I did. And I said, oh, I'm a director. And he said, oh, did you see there was this article in the New York Times this weekend about women directors in Hollywood? And I said, yeah, I'm in that article. <laughs> and he said, oh, well, what did you direct? And I said, well, I, I made this movie called The Diary of a Teenage Girl. And he said, well, I should, I should watch it. And I thought, sure, Tom Hanks, you're going to go watch my movie. But because he is the most honest person in Hollywood, five days later, he emailed me directly and said, I watched your movie. I loved it. Can we have a meeting? And it was just an email right from Tom Hanks, like not from an assistant. It went to my junk mail. <laughs> like, just like, um, and we ended up having a general meeting, which was really nice, and we talked about what kind of movies we want to make, and we ended up kind of forming a friendship over many years where we would kind of go back and forth with, what do you think about this? Nothing was ever quite right. So when I got brought on to this project, Peter Seraf and Yuri Henley, our producers who brought me this project, they said, listen, we've always imagined Tom Hanks in this part, but he's passed on the project. He's passed three times or something we've tried. Um, and I said, well, I kind of have a relationship with him. I could try. <laughs> and I called him, and within five days, he had signed on to the project. So it was like I performed a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll never be that cool again. So there, you know, it's also been mentioned a lot, the parallels, in a way, between um, his ethos and uh, Mr. Rogers. But... Um, I'm curious about what he's like to work with just as a director because I, this, my favorite story, one of my favorite stories of Tom Hanks recently is when he was making Bridge of Spies with Spielberg. His first day on the set with Mark Rylance, um, Tom Hanks, after they were finished shooting, pulled Spielberg aside and said, I am in awe of Mark Rylance, who later won an Oscar, and deservedly. He said to Spielberg, though, you have to stop me from mimicking him because never heard this story. I love that. And he said, he goes, I want you to really to stop the take if you notice any like, you know, of his acting and my acting. Oh, wow. Putting all that faith in, in the director. I mean... It, Tom is an actor who truly values the relationship between filmmaker and actor. I mean, he really... Susan Kelechi Watson, who plays Andrea, told a story recently that I'd never heard that the first day he came in, and we had already been filming for two weeks, and he basically was like, tell me how the captain works. What does she do? Does she do... Do you improv? Do you do this? Like, he comes in wanting to know, like, okay, this isn't my ship. This is her ship, and how is it going to be run? Um, you know, he's very respectful, and also, I think, real actors, actors who I love working with are the ones who want to be directed. I started as an actor. I always love to be directed. You can't see outside of yourself. You know, you can't see what you're doing and how it looks, and somebody else has to have a vision and trusting who that person is and that they know what they're doing and what they want, that's the joy of that relationship, is that that person is going to push you further than you would push yourself. And he is like that. You know, he's... If you ever say to him, let's do another take. I, I want to try something different. It's always great. Let's go again. You know, he, does, he never has like a, I'm just going to do it this way. I'm Tom Hanks. I do my thing. You know, it's just, he's not like that. 
It's pretty incredible. In interviews, he refers to you as the boss. Yeah. Uh, I think you, you heard him do that. Um, but he, there, he referred to me as the boss on set, as boss every day. <laughs> but, you know, in a way, it, it, well, obviously it's very true because you are, but also you had to be because you shot in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. um, which is just such a nice touch to all. Because you shot, could have shot in New York or L.A. And yeah, we loved shooting in Pittsburgh where Mr. Rogers was from. I mean, you go there and you feel like you're just walking amongst the ghosts of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And we, we filmed in the actual WQED studios where they filmed the show in the actual studio where they filmed. So we felt like we were just in sacred ground filming where he had actually filmed. But you had to make a, a, a sort of a, a tough decision, I think maybe the one of the first days, oh, when yeah. you walked in and all the people from Pittsburgh who loved him were there. Yeah. Well, I... I tend to run a really nice set. Like I like the place, the, when I'm working, I tend to say like, everyone can come visit. It's a warm place to work. You know, it's not kind of, I just like having a place that feels like a, a warm place. People's kids can visit. My kid visits all the time. But the first day that we showed up on WQED to film, we were unveiling our set, which we had meticulously rebuilt according to their um, blueprints and every, like so many months of work had gone into this set and we were filming in the actual studio where he had filmed, and it was gonna be the first day that he was gonna do the, Tom was gonna do the opening of the movie, the opening scene of the movie. Had to all be done in one long shot, because that's how they filmed the original show. We were filming on these old cameras, just like they filmed these tube cameras. Um, and I showed up that day, and it felt like it was just a wall of eyes, is what I remember. There were like 100 extra people there who had all shown up like to see Tom Hanks be Mr. Rogers, finally. And I just remember thinking, this is too much pressure. Like, how will he perform with all of these people? And it was the best intention. It was everybody there with so much love and anticipation and excitement, just like, oh, Tom's gonna do it. He's gonna do the sweater. He's gonna do the shoe toss. Like, we're gonna watch it. You know, it was out of total love and it was people who had worked on the show. It was all of our producers. It was anybody, everybody just came in. There were people there I had no idea who they were. And I just realized I had to kick everybody out. That if Tom was going to be able to do what he needed to do for that opening scene, and I thought about what Fred always said, which is that he would always imagine there was just one child on the other side of the camera. And, um, you know, the thing about Tom Hanks is he's such a kind guy. He would never ask for anybody to leave, but he would also be trying to, like, charm everyone there, talk to everyone, crack jokes, make sure everyone feels comfortable, and he probably wouldn't even ask for what he needs. And I probably wouldn't have gotten what I needed out of him performance-wise with that many people there. So I kind of took a deep breath and said, everybody out, every single person, if you don't need to be here, you know, you have to leave this room. And I'm sure I made a lot of people upset that day. But then we were able to just do that. We did 22 takes, I think, of that opening scene which is not normal for me, but it had to be all in one take. So we let it just be relaxed and play and have fun. And I told Tom to imagine his grandchild on the other side of the yeah. camera. And, and then we got it. Well, I want to ask you about, about uh, I don't know if it was in the script or if you had wanted it to open that way um, once you came on board, but uh, it's so disarming to open a film like that because it is so slow and so calm and we need to almost adapt ourselves to, to, his, to his tempo. Uh, what was we, the thinking? We never imagined doing it any other way until we were in the edit and we thought, oh, is this too bold of a way to, <laughs> to actually start this movie? But I think we, we realized a few things, that there was, in many ways, no other way to begin the movie. Um, you just have to go right to where, what you're familiar with, which is, I think, for those of us who grew up with Mr. Rogers, which I was just in England with the movie, and we were showing it to rooms and rooms of people who had never even heard of Mr. Rogers. But if you did grow up with the show, there's something that happens in your body when you're brought back to childhood when that opening shot starts, and you have the miniature, and you pan across the stoplight and the couch, and the door opens. I mean, it's like you get flooded with these two- or three-year-old memories, you know, when you were such a little kid. These, this visceral feeling comes back. So we wanted to recreate it as faithfully as possible. And um, we also realized it takes a minute to get used to Tom as Fred. Like there's a adjustment your brain has to do. And we were like, well, we gotta just jump in the deep end because the sooner we do that, the sooner your brain kind of readjusts and goes, okay, right. Yeah. And the other scene that I think even Tom, when he saw it on the, on the, in the script said, are you really gonna do this, is the minute of silence. 
Yeah. And maybe you can talk about also about Anne McCabe, who's your great editor. Yes. Has edited, I think, all, all three of your features? No, she's done my last two. Last, can you ever yes. forgive me in this can one? Can you ever forgive me in this film? Um, yes. I, t talk about just filming it, uh, editing so, it. So the minute of silence scene, um, well, one wonderful thing to note is that the, the restaurant is populated with a lot of people from Fred's life. His real wife, Joanne, is there in the restaurant. The real Mr. McFeely. Um, the real Bill Eisler and his wife Marty Eisler and a number of people from who worked on the neighborhood for years and years and years. So we thought it was really special to have this scene about the people who loved you into being and it was sort of populated with the people who loved Fred into being. Um, but yeah, I didn't really realize till we were doing press about it even how much Tom and Matthew felt hesitant about whether that scene was going to work particularly me having Tom break the fourth wall and look right into the camera lens, which was what I knew I wanted from that scene from the very beginning, um, and that I was really gonna let it sit, because I feel like the thing about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was he asked the kids to be active participants in the show. Um, there was always moments in the show where he would say, do you know what a violin does or something? And then he would wait for you to answer. The idea was, here you're supposed to talk back to the TV. And so, we knew we had this moment where we wanted our audience to become active participants. Um, but yeah, as we've been promoting it, Tom said, oh yeah, I thought this will never work. <laughs> I was like, really? You didn't let me know. I was so sure. You, uh, you mentioned Susan Kelechi Watson who plays... Yeah. Um, uh, Andrea. Right. I, I get, get, it's confused because it's Tom Juno and it's Lloyd. Um, I know. Lloyd Vogel. Lloyd yeah. Vogel. Um, and also, uh, Marianne Plunkett plays Joanne Rogers. Yes. And it's so... Great to see Christine Lottie for a couple scenes in I there. I know, I isn't seen. she incredible as the editor, Ellen? Um, but unlike your other two movies, this is not a woman story. Right. Um, but it is a very emotional man's story, or a, 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 a man going through an emotional Yeah, um, my joke about the evolution. subtitle was, this movie could be called Men and Their Feelings. Yeah. Um, yeah, I kind of always imagined I would only make movies about women because we just, even if I had a lifetime of making movies about women, we still wouldn't have enough. But um, my joke was that Mr. Rogers was the one man who could make me want to <laughs> make a movie about men. Um, but I guess I've realized as I've gone along in the same way that so much of what I've been committed to in my career is to show a wider range of women, that we don't have to have just one version or two, you know, a one-dimensional version of women on screen. In the same way, we need to have a wide range of masculinity that we get to see on the screen. And I think Fred represents a type of masculinity that we don't often celebrate. Um, he, I think, scared a lot of people in his time because he was such an emotional man and he was somebody who kind of had represented some feminine qualities in certain ways. And um, how important it is that we allow those type of men, that type of masculinity to be seen on screen and to be celebrated, um, it feels just as important. And obviously I'm raising a little kid and watching father-son relationships. I'm living in a house with my husband and son, watching them, you know, their relationships. So it's something I'm thinking a lot about in my life. I'm an observer of those relationships right now. Uh, and we haven't really talked too much about Matthew Reese, who really is the star, I mean, it's He's not Mr. Rogers' story, yeah. No, we really, early on, I mean, and this was how it was in the script, and it was what I thought was so brilliant about the script, is that Mr. Rogers can't be the protagonist of a movie. He's too good. He's too far along in his emotional evolution. He, he, he can't change, there's nowhere for him to go. Um, so he makes a great antagonist, though, because he can really elicit change out of, People, and that's what he did in his life. He, he was challenging to the people around him. He, he challenged people with his intimacy and with his desire for honesty. And he didn't really let anyone off the hook. Um, and so Matthew Reese does such a beautiful job playing Lloyd Vogel, who really almost becomes our stand-in for our own cynicism and neuroses. And he had really the emotional lifting, heavy lifting to do for this film. Uh, so one of the questions for me, and then I think we'll have like time for two or three from the audience. Yeah. Um, everybody who met him, obviously including Tom Juno, um, was changed forever uh, by the experience. So I'm curious to ask you. I mean, it's a big question, but like, how how have you been changed forever by making this film? I mean, it, I think we all feel like 
making this film has been a gift. It's been an honor in a way that I can't even begin to ex describe. Um, every day going to work, every day making this movie felt like we were all aware that we were doing something that had the potential to really reach people and to touch people. It's rare that you get to work on projects that feel that special, that feel like you get to make a positive change in the world through it. And living with Fred's message, his wisdom, his philosophy in our ear, as a parent, I mean, it's meant more to me than I can possibly explain. It's helped me to slow down, to be a kinder person, to listen with a total different yeah. ear. Yeah. Um, but I think I'll think about Fred for the rest of my life. I mean, it feels, I feel so lucky that I got to make this movie. I feel so grateful that his family and the people who worked with him were so generous with us and just welcomed them into their, welcomed us into their world. They shared all their stories with Fred. I really feel like I, I made very close family friends in all of these people. And I mean, Joanne Rogers, when we were in Toronto, she made me cry in an interview we were doing together by saying, my one regret is that I wish Fred had met you because I think you would have had great conversations and I just started crying in this interview. But it really does feel like we forged this incredible relationship with all of the people who... Even the, the scene, if I'm not wrong, the scene where she tells um, Lloyd, you know, he, he's not a saint. Yeah. That actually came from Joanne telling you that. Yeah, the first time we sat down together in her living room and we're having a deeper conversation about Fred, I had heard, you know, listen, they don't like it when we refer to him as a saint. And I didn't really understand it. And then she said it so clearly to me. She said, if you think of him as a saint, then his philosophy, his way of being is unattainable. You can't even aspire to it. And it's important you know he was a human being. Um, and so we put it in the, in the movie because of that exact conversation because it was so clear to me then why it was important that we don't think of him as a saint because his, the idea was not to see him on a pedestal as something above us and, oh, I can never be like him. It was to say, no, he made a choice every day. It was a practice. It was something he chose to do. He had the same anger, the same pain as the rest of us, and he chose what to do with it. And he did have a favorite actor, didn't he? Yeah, our first night in Pittsburgh that Tom Hanks came and met Joanne Rogers, and we all went out to dinner. None of us had heard this before, but she dropped that on him. She said, by the way, you were Fred Rogers' favorite actor in the world. And he was like, really? And then Bill Eisler said, yep. He went and saw Forrest Gump at the movie theater 40 times. <laughs> and he made all of us go. <laughs> he said he would just like on a Tuesday sometimes at 2 in the afternoon be like, I'm going back to the movie theater to see Forrest Gump again. Okay, who has, who has a question for... Uh, I'm coming oh, around. I'm sorry, Sean's going to... Hi. Um, among... Uh, everything that I loved about the film, which was pretty much everything, I'd like to ask you about a couple. Uh, one was a small thing. Um, your use of um, some of the soundtrack cuts, which um, really, I felt, moved the story along, B besides the ones that Fred Rogers himself wrote. I mean, Cat Stevens, Nick Drake, Tracy Chapman. Great stuff. I I'm wondering how you even knew about those songs, since you seem too young to remember that. Uh, much I'm less not. get to pick those tracks. And also uh, your ending, uh, which I found took my breath away uh, when Mr. Rogers goes to the piano and the, the set lights fade and he sits down and plays those dark notes. And, you know, it just was breathtaking. And I wonder if that was specifically a reference to some of his own private pain or um, was it based on an actual... Thing that he did. What do you think it was about? <laughs> he, he had some, some kind of pain that he could not or would not share or express with others. But after playing that dark chord, he goes right back into that light little um, uh, uh, tune that I'll tell you what I think it means, and then I'll say I am fine with however you want to interpret it. But, um, you know, when we were researching Fred, you realized people would come to him and just unload all of their troubles to him every day. And he would listen as long as they wanted to speak to him. And at one point, the writers went to Bill Eisler and said, did he ever tell you about all the things he was hearing about? Did he ever unload on you? And he said, oh, no, no. 
no, he didn't talk to me about that kind of thing. Maybe ask Joanne. And then they went to Joanne and they said, you know, did Fred ever share with you all of the painful things that people were bringing to him every day? And she said, oh, no, I think that was too personal. M maybe he spoke to Bill about it, though. I don't know. Ask Bill. And you realized he didn't, he was almost like a priest in the way that he took, like a vessel, took on other people's pain. And it wasn't that he didn't feel it himself. You know, I think he was very sensitive to the suffering of the world. And if you watched the documentary, there's a moment where, you know, he's always questioning whether he's doing enough. I don't think he walked around feeling at peace. He was always searching and hoping that he could do more and help more and be more present for people. And whether you believe in things like this or not, you know, he took a lot of people's pain on and he ended up dying of stomach cancer. Um, so for me, the ending had to do with his innate humanness, the fact that he was not without pain, but also that he really found ways to cope. He found ways that were healthy to cope with pain, and that was the whole thing that Lloyd had to learn, right, was what are his ways of dealing with his anger. Um, in terms of the music, I'm glad you enjoyed the music. I'm not too young. I went back to what was I listening to in 1998, Tracy Chapman was pretty much the soundtrack of my 1998. So that song, The Promise, that we have in there was something I wrote down in a notebook maybe two years ago thinking about what songs I might want in the show, in the film. And um, I can't believe she let us use it. She doesn't let her music in very many things. So it was I never had any other song in that section. Um, Cat Stevens, I mean, Cat Stevens is just one of my favorite artists. I listen to Cat Stevens every every week, pretty much. And I was a huge Harold and Maude fan, and um, that song also was the first and only song we put in that section, and I didn't think we were gonna get it, so it was just amazing that we did. Um, the Nick Drake song, that one took a lot of work to figure out what the right thing was there, so we did try, my, my music supervisor, Howard Parr, and I tried a lot of things together with our composer, Nate, figuring out how to go from this Mr. Rogers-like score into a piece of music that could expand us out into the world of New York City in 1998. It was a more complicated sequence to figure out. Um, but we just got so, Howard works miracles, and we just got so lucky that we got the music that we really wanted. We didn't have a lot of songs in the movie that were source songs. We had a lot of score, but we got really lucky that we got the ones we really loved. And Raffi. I mean, I grew up listening to Raffi, and we have that one Raffi song in there. Um, it was really, it was a really great movie. Um, the plot seemed very risky, actually, hmm. because of the emotional story that you were telling. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if Tom Hanks is the only person who really could have made that work. I mean, in so many ways, I think Tom Hanks was the only person who could have played Mr. Rogers, at least the only well-known movie star actor who could have played Mr. Rogers. If it hadn't been him, maybe we would have had to find somebody relatively unknown. Um, but it's a really tricky emotional tightrope that you have to walk. And the way we feel about Tom Hanks is somewhere weirdly similar to how we feel about Mr. Rogers, although they are such different people when it comes to real life. I mean, I think Fred was a real introvert and very shy and not somebody who... Um, was a natural performer. I actually think he sort of pushed himself out of his comfort zone in order to do the show because he believed so much in the philosophy behind what he was doing. But I don't think he was actually a natural performer or even somebody who was naturally comfortable really being in front of people or talking to people that much. Whereas Tom is the opposite. Tom is hilarious. He's always cracking jokes. He's making sure everybody's comfortable. He's really charming. He's really loud. <laughs> He's like, really boisterous. I don't know. He's just a joyful but bigger than life person. And Fred was very reserved. So they have something that's similar about how we feel about them, but energetically they were like so I mean, different. I mean, you know that he uses social media to post photos of gloves that he sees on the street and telling people, I, I, I found your glove if you, if, uh, yeah. if, if, if. <laughs> a lost shoe. Yeah. I know. It's so funny. He, he's a hilarious person. We were in London doing press just this last week, and he and Matthew are cracking jokes so much. I mean, we can't even really talk about the movie because they're just making jokes the whole time and goofing around. Matthew made a really funny joke when he was asked about how was it doing a movie with 
Tom Hanks and Chris Cooper, these Academy Award winning actors, and he said he would walk into the trailer and just say, can I get anyone anything to eat? <laughs> like, he just felt so uncomfortable, like, I'll get you guys coffee. One Are more? We, last one. Play a good one. Hey, wonderful film. We really enjoyed it. Um, just a quick question about the scene with the kids that start singing on the train. I think this whole aisle was crying when that started <laughs> happening. So can you dissect why you put that in there a little bit more and maybe comment on that? The subway scene really happened, and it really happened um, to Tom Juno. It was an experience he witnessed. Um, I think if it hadn't really happened, I would have thought it was sort of too much of a movie moment to go into a movie, you know what I mean? Um, and it, it actually was one of the harder scenes to nail tonally because I didn't want it to tip over into too cheesy or to something that felt unreal. Um, you know, it was really important to me that we, that the people populating the subway felt real. You know, those of us who live in New York, we know weird things like that in New York do happen, where you get like stuck on a train and everybody, all of a sudden something happens and everybody, we have these collective experiences that other cities I think don't really experience. Um, but we, so we, the kids we brought from a, they were, they were basically a chorus in Brooklyn and we brought them into, and they learned the song because of course none of them had ever heard the song before. Um, and then all of the background extras who were in the train, I didn't let anybody really rehearse or learn the song before. I wanted it to feel sort of improvised and if they didn't know all the words, that was great. That's how that would be. It would be like, ah, da, 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 neighborhood, da, da, you know, that, that's great. We don't want it to be perfect. We didn't want it to be like a chorus starts singing. Um, and then also I wanted there to be a feeling that when they first call out for him, you think, oh, are they going to make fun of him, right? Because I think that's sort of the feeling we all have, too, about how vulnerable Mr. Rogers is, that, you know, there's this famous story that his car got stolen one time. He, he drove, like, a Toyota Corolla or something, and uh, his car got stolen, and when it was on the local news that it was his car that got stolen, the robbers returned it the next day <laughs> with a note that said, we're sorry, Mr. Rogers, we didn't know it was your car. Um, but it's like we all have this protective feeling about him where we don't, we don't want, like, teenagers on the subway to make fun of him, and it would just be so easy for that to happen. So I wanted there to be that moment where you think, which way is this going? And then it tips into that other direction. It actually was a tricky a tricky line to toe with that scene. So I'm glad that it worked and you guys were feeling it. And uh, yeah, and it was real. That's the crazy thing is it really happened. Before we finish, I just want to recommend uh, Tom Juno's original Esquire article. Absolutely. Which was the, and it's very different um, than, I mean, it's the basis of your film, but it's, it not, is. it's not. Well, it's an article kind of like no other article you'll ever read. It's just not how articles are supposed to be written. A journalist teacher told me recently that he teaches that article because it's, it's pretty profound. And Tom Juno just wrote a follow-up article in The Atlantic um, about his friendship with Fred and about the film and how this experience has been for him. Both are incredible pieces of writing. And also to recommend to anyone who hasn't seen Diary of a Teenage Girl and Can You Ever Forgive Me? Yes, please. Please see those if you haven't. Thank you. And please, you've made, uh, you've made three films in five years. I hope you make three more in the next five years. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> please. We'll see. Thank you, Mario. Thank you so much, Joe.